All right, it's seven o'clock. I'm getting started, folks. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second edition of the Fairbanks Museum's Night Owl Club. And my name is Bobby Farley Rubio, and I want to introduce Christian Hubs, who is also joining us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are here to answer all of your questions about astronomy, in particular, whatever has been happening lately in the news. And I hope you were uh, watching Channel 3 on Monday when I was talking about some very historic stuff going on on the planet Mars, but also a historic anniversary that is happening on technically Monday, but being celebrated on Saturday night. And this is a new international holiday. It's called Yuri's Night, and it is named in honor of Yuri Gagarin. So this is a person that everyone should know about. And it always saddens me when so many people don't know about the first person who actually ever flew into space. So, oh, looks like uh, we got more people coming in. So now, Yuri Gagarin flew into space on a rocket called the Vostok 1 mission on April 12th, 1961. So this Monday will be the 60th anniversary of the first ever voyage of any person into outer space. So let's see, let me make sure we're not having a problem with Facebook. Hold on a second. Sorry folks, I'm just a little technical delay here. It's telling me they told me I was doing all right. Let me see. Sorry, folks, not to interrupt, but we'll get this going in a moment. So, by the way, Christian, feel free to chime in if you've got anything you would like to share about what you know. Christian Hubs, by the way, is an expert on a lot of the history of science missions and space missions. He knows a lot about the hardware and the details. And so if you have something you'd like to share about Yuri Gagarin's mission while I try to fix this uh, Facebook problem, go ahead and chime in. Yeah, yeah, I see we're trying to get the Facebook stream going. Um, yeah, it's just a really exciting, uh anniversary here so it's the 60th for Vostok 1 and I kind of like to try to think about like what it was like back then nobody had ever really been in a space before um, I think the highest anybody had ever been was just like in uh, high altitude balloons or something or experimental aircraft so yeah it was pretty big news around the whole world um, you know obviously it was better news on the Soviet side some people in the U.S. were kind of scared at the time because, you know, same thing with Sputnik 1. It was kind of like the Russians are beating us. So it kind of sparked the, the feeling in the U.S. that we need to catch up. And it was actually just uh, less than a month after this mission was the first uh, U.S. astronaut in space, Alan Shepard, in uh, the Mercury Redstone mission. But yeah, it was uh, definitely a highlight of the space race early on. Well, and I don't know if you heard this particular detail, Christian, but um, we are streaming live on Facebook, just so uh, you folks know, if you have friends who are trying to join us. Um, the, the He didn't have a soft landing. Do you know about that part about the mission? This is the part that blows me away the most of when I learn about Yuri's flight into space. Uh, normally we think of an astronaut parachuting and splashing down inside the capsule, right? or, you know, them later Soyuz capsules come down with retro rockets that they fire before they hit the ground, but you're still inside the capsule. But isn't it crazy that the first person to fly into space actually had to jump out of his capsule when he was still more than a mile up in the sky? So you have already been in space and then you have to manage and get the wherewithal to jump out of your spaceship in time before it crashes in the field in the middle of Russia. And he jumps out deploys his parachute, it's kind of like an ejector seat, like on a fighter jet. And he parachutes down separately from the spacecraft and landed in a field where there were only four eyewitnesses. Can you imagine what these people were thinking? Thinking that 
that they might have been seeing an alien invasion. Maybe this was one of those science fiction movies that they had seen in the movie theater. And then all of a sudden they realize it is a person from their own country landing on the ground. He had to remind them he was a Soviet citizen. So I'm gonna just share some pictures uh, for those of you who have not seen what Yuri Gagarin looks like. This is uh, a picture of the two you know, big uh, magazines at the time, the New Weekly still around, Newsweek and Time Magazine, the cover talking about the first person to fly in space. Yes, and of course, you can't ignore the politics and the context of all of this happening during the middle of the Cold War. So here is the actual picture of the launch. But if you can imagine 1961, right? The, there wasn't like there was a lot of public uh, announcements about this. The Soviet Union was notoriously secretive. And so this was discovered indirectly. And this caused quite a stir because it felt like just like with Sputnik a couple of years before, we were getting left in the dust and we were gonna be dominated in space by another country that in the United States was seen as our enemy during the Cold War. But let's separate the politics and the geopolitics out from the fact that this poor guy, Yuri Gagarin, he just had one job and his job was to successfully fly around the earth. He was in space for about an hour and if you notice his, his, his death, I don't know exactly what led to his demise, but he did not have a long life. He only lived 34 years. And I don't think it's related to anything that he did in space, but he also- I think it was a plane crash of some sort. I think he was in a, some sort of plane accident. Yeah, but... nothing to do with his space career is what I meant, yeah. But- you know... I, I do know one fact about his death is uh, before he died, he was scheduled to be on the Soyuz 1 mission. And um, I forget the name of that cosmonaut, but that, uh, is one of the first deaths in space because of the they had a landing failure, but he was actually supposed to be on that mission. Um, but I remember that's a story in itself. Wow. Well, I didn't know that weird thing, but that's one of those many hypotheticals. What if he had been on there? It may not have crashed or that might have led to his demise too. So another thing that we should mention besides the anniversary of the first flight of any human into space, not a coincidence that when NASA was launching its space shuttle, it chose that date also, April 12th, in 1981, 20 years later, for the first launch ever of the space shuttle Columbia. Now, this picture is beautiful, but there's a little tragedy in here because you may also know as the, the Columbia was one of our shuttles that suffered a terrible disaster later on. And that was actually what spelled the end of the space shuttle program. But this was the beginning of the space shuttle program. And I wonder who's out, who out there is noticing a detail about this picture because there's something that we space nerds might uh, notice that the most folks might not notice about the space shuttle list. You see a Christian, I know Christian wants to shout it out. What is it? What, what is weird about it, this appearance in this picture? Well, you know, part of the iconic look of the shuttle when it's all stacked up on the pad is that big orange tank. Uh, <laughs> you don't really see that in this picture. <laughs> Yeah, do you know the story behind that tank, the why they changed the color? Or... Well, I think it was more, it was going to be white by default at first because, you know, the Saturn V and all of NASA's rockets, they always had like a coat of paint on it. Then they realized it's just hundreds of pounds of extra weight that they didn't need of, of paint over the foam. And the orange color is just, I think, the foam itself. And <laughs> that's fine to be exposed. Uh, so they didn't need the paint. So you just saved the mess. Exactly. Well, I feel like they're having a little trivia quiz here with Christian, but yes, that's exactly what happened. The, the white paint was all show, but in space, weight is everything. And it roughly costs a million dollars per pound when you're launching something into space. So wasting that on paint is not worth it. And so it makes a lot more sense to just let it be the foam naked, so to speak. And that was what the orange color was. But I mean, this is a beautiful picture of this spaceship, but I also am stunned by the fact that this is only 20 years later than the first human space flight. So the progress is astounding. And today we have the new Crew Dragon that SpaceX is making, and it actually resembles more of the Apollo era uh, spacecraft. You know, relatively speaking, it looks simple compared to the space shuttle. So I know some folks might even think that the space shuttle was kind of like an extension that we kind of retreated from. It was kind of trying to make space flight more like flying a plane, but that turned out to not be, from an engineering standpoint, the most safe design. So we don't use the space shuttles anymore. And you know that was a part of my childhood watching those launches. But today's kids get to see the Crew Dragon, including the one that's docked on the International Space Station. Right now, I just read that they're gonna move it 
uh, from one side of the space station to the, to the other, which is a first for that brand new spaceship. So a lot has happened in 60 years since Yuri flew. Uh, let's look at him one more time. And then I want to share with you something that the Fairbanks Museum is considering. It's going to be based on whether you folks decide to tell us if you want us to host this kind of a celebration. But every year around the world, there are folks who celebrate what's now called Yuri's Night. And I'm just going to show you the page to give you an idea of what it would look like if it wasn't a pandemic year. <laughs> so the, just be encouraged, those of you getting your vaccines, please do as soon as possible so we can return to having uh, nights like this. But Yuri's night, the celebration is actually happening on Saturday night because that makes more sense for a party than a Monday night. But if you go to this website, yurisnight.net, you, you can, we'll post it on the Fairbanks Museum social media. But this is an international live stream. You can see what they're doing all around the world. The question is, should the Fairbanks Museum be one of the places that hosts Yuri's night parties in the future, starting in, you know, 2022, when hopefully there will be no worries about the pandemic and we'll be able to have a gathering here. So since nobody in this area celebrates Yuri's night, I mean, we are the Fairbanks Museum. We're the leader in this region of, on astronomy education. So we should be talking about this every year and making it a local holiday. So I know Christian would agree. And you folks let us know through the chat or through emails or when you uh, get your memberships at the Fairbanks Museum, uh, you know, let us know what you think about this kind of thing because we don't really have uh, any events at this time of year that in Vermont is usually mud season. Although outside lately, it's more like crocus season. It's been very beautiful and warm and dry. So enough with that for a moment because there's a bigger topic perhaps looking forward towards the future that I would like to address now. And of course, NASA is really good with the, the symbolism and the historical uh, you know, acknowledgement. So on April 11th, the day before the, for the anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's flight, we have the Ingenuity helicopter that's already being tested on Mars. They just spun its rotors and I can show you the recent pictures that they posted. But this little helicopter that weighs on Earth about four pounds, on Mars it only weighs about one and three quarter pounds because of the lower gravity. This little helicopter is going to fly on Sunday. When it flies, if it flies, and I, I think it will, it will be the first time that we've ever flown an aircraft on another planet. And the cool thing about flying it on the 11th is that it takes a while for the images and the videos to get downloaded from the Perseverance rover on Mars. So we will be getting our images of this happening and hopefully even some video. And it, I know it has a color camera on board Ingenuity. So we might even see bird's eye views of Mars from this helicopter on the 12th. So we'll celebrate the first human going into space while we celebrate seeing the first aircraft flying on another planet. And perhaps April 12th will forever and you know into the future become a day of great significance when people try to do something new that has never been done before. So it's, a, it's an awesome way to think about what else will be happening on April 12th going on in the future. So I can, let me switch to that. Instead of just talking about that, let's go and check on the rover real quick. And then I wanna turn things over to folks who would like to ask questions. So here we go. First, I had this on earlier, if you tuned in at the very beginning, this is one of the recent pictures that NASA posted. This is a selfie with two robots. So Perseverance, the rover on the right, is you can see it's a two image thing. They're just repeating the same image sequence. It's a GIF for those of you that are internet savvy. So this is just the robot turning its head, looking towards the little helicopter ingenuity. But this picture uh, was recently posted, but all of this is available on the Mars Rover's main website. And you can see these images as soon as they pop up. But since the last Night Owl Club, we talked about the landing of this rover. Since that time, an enormous number of things have happened. They've actually made recordings of the robot driving on the ground so we can hear the sound of Mars on the website. And I can show you how to navigate. Oh, I didn't mean to do that, sorry. I actually want you to say, see this? Um, trying to close this picture out. So you can find all of this on the main page. I'm just gonna go to the, the, the headline page. So you can see on the multimedia section, there's images but there's something that's never been in one of these before, an audio section. This is new for all of us. And maybe you've never heard this before, but if you have speakers on, if you have a TV or your computer, maybe turn up the volume a bit because you're about to hear 
the first ever recordings of a robot driving on the surface of Mars. Squeaky. You can hear lots of gravel and little pebbles and stuff getting caught up in the tire treads. It reminds me of the way snow sounds when it's colder than 10 degrees and you walk on it, it kind of squeaks. It is a yeah, it's, <laughs> it's really cold there, so those pebbles are squeaking. Yeah, they're singing a lot. And listen to the metal wheels bouncing off the rocks. The steel drum band. Those hollow wheels are like drums, so they kind of ring. Now, you can listen to a lot more. In fact, there's 16 minutes of audio down below if you'd like to hear that. I'll let you folks navigate your way there. It almost sounds kind of like audio from underwater, and I think that has to do with the air density being so thin, so it's kind of like the, the air doesn't reverberate through to the microphone as clearly as it would on Earth. Yes, there's a whole entire section on the website about how sounds are very uh, muted. So you can hear a piano being played on Earth and then a piano, what it would sound like if you were on Mars. And it sounds like you're losing your hearing because the pressure of the air is 1% of what we have here on Earth. So with 1% of the air pressure, you have like 1% of the capacity to carry the sound. It's not exactly that simple, but think of the other end of the extreme. Like when you go underwater, you may know that humpback whales, which I'm very grateful to say have been removed from the endangered species list. That was just in the news today. And if you're a Star Trek fan, you know that means that those aliens won't be attacking us in the future. Like in Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, that was the whole plot of the movie, the humpback whale. Anyway, I won't digress. But underwater, humpback whales are famously capable of communicating thousands of miles because it, the water is so dense, it can carry the sound waves. Air can carry sound miles, but not hundreds of miles, unless it's really loud. So you can imagine with 1% air pressure, air sound has barely a chance to get far before it disappears in the wind, sort of. And one other thing I wanna play for you before we leave the audio behind, because there's so many pictures to see too, laser shots. I just wanna explain this. First, acoustic recording of laser shots. Now, I always joke that this robot has a laser to protect itself against Martians, but that's not really true. The reason why this robot has a laser built into what they call the super cam, it's on its head. It looks like a little telescope, which is what it is on its forehead, is that it actually can analyze rocks from a distance of, of I think up to 30 feet. So if there's a rock out of reach or even in reach and it wants to know what it is, it can zap it with a laser and take a telescopic image of the light coming from the laser beam hitting the rock, vaporizing the rock, well, I'll show you the rock that got zapped, but this is what it sounds like. And then they can do a spectral analysis to see what's in the rock and discover any elements that might be inside. But it's not like Marvin the Martian's blaster. Sorry, folks. Sounds like snapping fingers. That's a laser being repeatedly shot over and over again. And I just want to show you the rock that they blasted. And the fastest way I know how to find it is on the Mars Rover Twitter page because a couple of days ago they posted a picture of this rock and we'll go through some more of these pictures, but I'm about to switch to question mode. So I wanna make sure, oh, here it is. So here is the rock that they were zapping with the laser. And I'm gonna to try, to try to draw on this for a second to show you that it's very faint, but there's a series of about eight little holes right there. And those, are the holes that were blasted by the laser. And they were kind of testing the thing out on this rock that they found. But this rock is in itself interesting because look at it, 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 it's porous. Could it be a volcanic rock from Mars's volcanic history? That's possible. But now I wanna say something without getting accused of getting sensationalist, all right? I don't want anybody to think I'm saying there's Martians already. But the first thing I thought of when I saw this rock was that it looked like an old piece of coral. Now, if it were coral, that would be an incredibly huge discovery because on Earth, coral rocks are made by living things, right? So when they get old limestone coral rocks turn like this and they get eroded and they have all these pores and holes from when it was a living thing at the bottom of the sea, this is not in any way saying that we found Martian coral. 
Let's just imagine that this robot has the tools to dig through the sand, analyze the chemistry, look for molecules that could be sourced in life. And it could be as simple as stumbling upon it that we might find proof that there was life on Mars in the past. So I want to just go quickly back to the, uh, the main rover page here. And I, I hope you folks navigate this frequently. These pictures are getting amazing. And they've already taken 23,789 of them. But let's see if I can, oh, there was one picture they posted. Oh, right there. So if you remember last Night Owl Club, if you were here, we talked about them descending and the video of that descent. And you might remember that in the video, there was, oh, go back to that picture. Hold on. I want the website to stay there. So I want to point out something. Do you see the layers in this picture? All these sedimentary layers clearly visible in this big lump of mud. This is the delta, the alluvial fan delta that stretches out under the river that flowed into this lake. So it's kind of like we're getting a cross section, an x-ray. And if you are familiar with Vermont geology, you might know that there are eskers in this valley. In fact, up and down along Route 5, between Burke and Barnett, all the way down the river, are these piles of sand that were left behind from the glacial erosion caused by the Ice Age. So our sand pits, like the ones in our neighborhood in the town of Barnet gets its sand from one of these. When you drive by, you can see where they've recently excavated, you can see similar sedimentary layers, layers caused by every year's spring floods during the Ice Age. So the fact that I can drive a few miles from the museum and look at a landscape that looks exactly like this on Mars is very exciting because it tells me that there could be all kinds of stuff. Every one of these layers could be a different year in Mars' history and who knows what could be in there when the robot reaches that place. But that is the long-term goal, but the short-term goal is getting that helicopter to fly. Um, and there it is, that's the picture of little ingenuity with its little carbon fiber props and its little solar panel. And they were recently testing it. So they made its propellers wiggle and it works. It's even taken pictures. So everything, everything is set up to work, but we just have to hope on Sunday that it can fly. So I hope I've given you enough topics to ask about folks. There's a lot of things going on. And if, you, if anyone wants to be brave and ask the first question, maybe we can do this in a way that's easy is by using the reactions button on the bottom of your Zoom bar. You'll see that little smiley face. You hit that, you can raise your hand and that'll pop up in my screen and that'll let me know that you would like to speak and then we'll get you unmuted so we can join in. But please uh, let me know if anyone would like to ask and also use the chat function. You may see that uh, Behind the scenes, Allison is one running our Fairbanks Museum Education channel and she's asked for your questions there. So if you don't want to speak up, you can put your question in the chat. If you want to get brave and be heard by the rest of us, please uh, speak up. But who's got the first question? Uh, we have one question in our queue here. Uh, first question is from William. Uh, how does gravity on Mars compare to Earth's gravity? Well, luckily, this is an easy thing for me to remember. It's the fraction three eighths. So that's a little less than a half, right? Multiply your weight or any weight that you can think of by three eighths, and that will tell you what it would weigh on Mars. So maybe you heard me say that helicopter ingenuity on Earth weighs four pounds, but on Mars, it weighs about one and three quarter pounds, three eighths. So that's an easy fraction to remember. And just to give you a comparison, and you got the globes behind me, I've got my Mars over here and my moon over here. Mars has three eighths gravity. These globes are not to scale. This, the moon is much smaller. The moon is like the size of Australia and the moon has one sixth of the gravity. So the moon has considerably less gravity, but when we go to Mars, we will notice that we all have lost half our weight. So mark my words, I joke about this, but in the future when going to Mars is as easy as uh, going to Florida, I imagine that Mars is going to be the human retirement colony because everybody there will weigh half as much as they did on Earth and all those hips and knees will feel like they're new again. So maybe Mars will be like the Arizona of the future, a red desert filled with retirees. So that's just my silly imagination. But 
All right, I see a question from the Pellerin boys. Um, Bob, before we move on, I just want to say one last thing about the ingenuity before we move on from that. Oh, please, so, please. yeah, because because the gravity is so low, people have, I've been seeing people asking online and stuff, uh, how is this thing going to fly when the air is so thin on Mars? And you see it has those really big propellers, but because the gravity is so low, those propellers aren't having to lift as much of the weight of the, the craft. So, um, and also their propellers are going to be spinning really fast. Uh, I don't know the exact RPM, but it's, it's uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, I don't know if you could pull up that first image you showed of the rover uh, in, the, in the helicopter together, but um, I noticed something in the background there. You can actually see the rover's tire tracks. Yeah, that one right there. You can kind of see like the two lines going in the back and it kind of loops around. I think that's where the rover was scouting out the like, almost like a runway. I remember seeing a picture of NASA outlined like a, there's a runway on Mars where they're, yeah, right there. It's kind of curving around. So I just thought it was cool. The the rover's kind of like scouting out the runway for the helicopter. Yeah, they did post that picture of the runway. Um, in fact, that's again, the Twitter feed. In fact, I've basically become a Twitter user lately just to follow this robot. Here's that picture you were referring to. Of yeah, the, there we go. Uh, area. So. This is, and the rover uh, was where that white dot is, but this picture is several days old and it's probably moved to that area where the rectangles are because that's where it's probably going to, uh, it dropped the robot. It's probably retreating from that zone to give it room to fly. So this is so exciting. It seems like such a small thing, but just imagine the inspiration that this will cause when we see this thing actually flying on another planet. And if it doesn't work, it will be another humbling moment showing us what we need to learn to try to explore other worlds. There's no, there's no bad turnout for this mission. There's no bad ending. Even if we find nothing, we will learn so much from it. But another cool thing that you can see here is just some of the steps of it uh, uh, dropping the robot. You can see, uh, if you go on the Twitter feed, you can see the little steps. It was actually carried underneath and then it got dropped. Its battery was charged and now it is on its own. And one of the limitations for this robot is that it's cold every night on Mars, about 100 below zero. And so its batteries, just like <laughs> Vermonters know about car batteries under really cold mornings when your car won't start. Yes, this will sap the energy from the batteries and the, this little ingenuity has already got a limited lifespan. Sad to say, it's not gonna work forever. But here's the question I would like to ask. Who's going to be the first person in history to walk and go see where ingenuity is at rest, probably buried under the dust after years from this test? You know, there's going to be somebody who's get the job to maybe because I, I work at a museum, go curate this display and maybe put a little tag next to it saying this was from 2021, the first historic flight. Think about it. It's like Wright Brothers for Mars. This is what this little guy is going to be. So it's pretty exciting. Now, uh, let's see, I'm looking to see what other questions are coming in. And I see one from the Pellerin boys about what is the difference from a gas giant star and a gas giant planet? That is an excellent question. And I actually have a fun way uh, to show you uh, this difference between different sizes of things in the universe. But, okay, first, let's just remember this, hydrogen. H on the periodic table, the H that put the H and H2O, water, hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. And about 75% of the entire universe is just hydrogen. So the biggest things in the universe, stars, are made of mostly hydrogen. And the biggest planets like Jupiter and Saturn are also made out of hydrogen. So there's a lot of hydrogen to go around. So it makes sense uh, that bigger things can be made from it. We are made of materials that are a lot less uh, likely to be found, a lot less common. We are made out of the minerals like calcium and the silver, copper, magnesium, phosphorus. These things are in tiny quantities in the universe. So look at it this way. You can't build that many big rocky planets because there aren't that many rocks to go around. But you can build a lot of giant gas planets and stars because there's just tons more hydrogen than anything else in the universe. 
So with that in mind, in honor of the Pellerin boys, great question. Let me show you a little scale thing that I like to teach with. It's a video that you can actually find on YouTube, scale of the universe, or uh, let me see. This is a version that I use. Starts with the moon. So we see the size of the moon compared to the size of planet Mercury. The moon is about the size of Australia. Mercury is about a third the size of the earth. Mars, we landed that robot on, is about half the size of the earth. And here's Venus without its atmosphere, about the same size as planet earth. We're the biggest rocky planet in the solar system. And then you get to Neptune, a gas giant. If they skipped Uranus, because nobody wants to see Uranus, just kidding. But Saturn is the second biggest. Jupiter is the biggest gas giant planet. But then this is the size of the sun. So the sun is huge compared to a gas giant planet, but the sun is not that big compared to other stars. You just saw Sirius, the bright star we see tonight. Pollux is in the Gemini twins, also visible tonight. Arcturus is a star that you can see in the sky tonight. And Aldebaran is in Taurus the bull. And then the next star that you're gonna see is from Orion's left knee, Rigel. And look at how much bigger this star called the pistol star is that you have to see from the other hemisphere, the Southern hemisphere. And Antares, the heart of the Scorpion constellation is even bigger. And then you get to Musifii, which is in Cepheus, the Ethiopian king in the northern sky tonight and then vy canis majoris and since then we found even larger stars but vy canis majoris in the big dog canis major constellation would make the earth look like a flea on a dog relative to size so the pelerin boys you gave me an excuse to show this awesome video and that's on video that's on youtube star size comparison hd now that i remember it maybe christian could find the link but i think you could search for it easily however now that you know how big things are, let me just explain the last part of the question. The difference between Jupiter and the sun is that the sun is glowing with its own light. In the core of the sun, the temperatures are so high that the hydrogen that's abundant everywhere is being fused into helium. And that general reaction yields an enormous amount of heat and light. And that's what makes the sun shine. So the sun is a thermonuclear reactor running on fusion of hydrogen, creating helium. But Jupiter, sorry, Jupiter, you're just not big enough. Jupiter would have to be about 30 times more massive for it to turn into a star. And there are stars the size of Jupiter. So maybe I'm going off on a tangent here, but you may have heard of an exoplanet system known as Trappist-1. It was discovered by the University of Belgium's telescope uh, in South America since the Trappist monks are famously a Belgian cultural contribution, they named this system uh, Trappist. And let me just see if this picture will make sense. I hope you can see. There's the sun, the big red dot. Jupiter is the red dot with the little spot in the middle. And do you see the 1A star right here? That star has the seven dwarf planet system that they jokingly call it. And their sun is the size of Jupiter. So what's the difference? Jupiter is too light and fluffy. It doesn't have a fusion reaction going on, but Trappist-1, the star, does. And this discovery was so exciting that NASA made a little travel poster for it. Planet hop from Trappist-1e. This is a tiny solar system that we've discovered that has seven planets that are all Earth-sized or close to that. And they're all really close together going around a red sun. And the planets are so close together that if you were sitting on one of them, the other planets would look that big in the sky. It's amazing, but that is something that we've discovered. And maybe one day this travel poster that NASA made kind of as a joke will not be a joke, but will be a fact. I mean, maybe one day you'll visit that place. Let's compare it to our system, the TRAPPIST-1 system, just in case you're wondering. Look at the TRAPPIST-1, B, C, D, E, F, and G. If you look at their orbital period, one of them takes one and a half days to go around the sun that it has. So they're really close to that star. But E and F, the ones that take six days and nine days to go around their star, they are thought to be in the Goldilocks zone, meaning they are possibly the same temperature range as planet Earth where they could have liquid water on their surface. So good thing you asked about that Pellerin boys, because that gave me a lot of excuses to talk about a lot of cool different things. So let me see what other questions are coming in. And Christian, if you hear about any others, uh, let me know. But I see that John Bongartz has asked, we know there is water on Mars from the ice cap on the North Pole. Why didn't the rover land near this water source? Well, 
this rover's job was not to discover water, but the Mars Phoenix mission that John is referring to, that one did actually go to near the North Pole to find water. So we already know there's been water on Mars. The mission that we have now was not meant to find more water. It was meant to find if life ever existed. So we are closer to the equator for this mission because just think about temperatures and climate and on earth, where would you go or where would you send an alien if you told them you wanted them to find the most abundant amount of life? They probably wouldn't be at the coldest poles. You might see a polar bear, or if you go south, you might see a penguin and a few other creatures. But if you send them to close to the equator and they land in the Amazon rainforest, those life searching aliens are gonna be very satisfied with what they see it near the equator. So under that logic, Mars would have been warmest and maybe most habitable near the equator when it had water on the surface, even if there's ice on the poles. So that's some of the thinking about that, John, and I hope that answers your question. So now, where did the water go? Alex wants to know, I see. So this actually lets me refer you to another mission. So I, I, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but since I was talking about water being discovered on Mars, let me actually show you what that entailed here real quick is just the Mars Phoenix mission, something that you should know about. This is was made by the University of Arizona and that's why they named it Mars Phoenix. And here is, is a picture that it took of its own shadow near the North Pole of Mars. And here's a picture of an actual chunk of water. It looks like a boulder, but it's made out of ice that they found under the ground. And here is a picture of a scoopful that actually has ice in it. That white stuff in there turned out to be water. So here is a picture of where we found water on Mars. Not a place where we went to look for life, but just so you know, if life did live on Mars, why wouldn't it have been there too? So that's Mars Phoenix. But so somebody asked, where did the water go? Okay. Sorry, just kicking over my tea container here. So Mars has 1% air. This is why the helicopter has to struggle to fly. But this is also why we don't find water on Mars. It's not just because it's so cold that it's all frozen. That is also true. Is that because with 1% air pressure, water can boil and freeze at the same time. I expect this to spawn a lot of questions, but let me just explain by talking about what happens here on Earth when you go to high altitudes, okay? If you live near sea level, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 C, right? But if you live in Denver, the mile high city, you may have noticed that sometimes baking mixes like Jiffy, you know, muffin mix will tell you if you live above 5,000 feet above sea level, use this recipe. Why? Because if you live that high up, you have less air over your head and the air pressure is lower and water boils easier at a lower temperature. Now, Denver's a mile high, but imagine going to the top of Mount Everest. Mount Everest is so high up that the air pressure is roughly 50% of what it is at sea level. That is why people die frequently climbing Mount Everest because they simply cannot pull in enough oxygen at 50% air pressure. But uh, I've heard, I've never been, but I've heard that the Sherpas love to amaze all the newcomers to the mountain by doing this trick where they put water in the palm of their hand and they see the water boil from the heat of their hand. And you could take a tea kettle that is boiling and steaming hot and drink the water directly from the tea kettle and you will not be burned because it's a trick. At 50% air pressure, the boiling point of water is around 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So that means that your body is hot enough for the water to boil away from your hand because the air pressure is so low. 50% air pressure, you can boil water at 95. So imagine 1% air pressure. That is what Mars is at. So the question about why Mars doesn't have water has to be answered by why doesn't Mars have enough air to keep the water down? So if I went to Mars with a bucket of water and I dumped it on the sand, it would freeze if it was cold, but it would also boil at the same time. And you would see the water turn into vapor and not sit on the ground as a puddle because it would just turn into steam immediately. And it would still be cold. So you could see freezing and boiling at the same time on the surface of Mars. So it's kind of sad to imagine that there were oceans and rivers on Mars and eventually they dried up partly by being absorbed by the ground 
Some of it might have leaked into the rocks underground, but much of it must have boiled off into the sky. So then the next question is, where'd the water go? Isn't it in the air? Is it in the clouds? Well, Mars has clouds, but the clouds are made out of carbon dioxide. There isn't enough water in the Martian atmosphere to make clouds. So this is where I turn to another mission that answered this question. And this is a mission that barely gets any attention compared to uh, you know, the rovers on Mars. MAVEN is an orbiter. And the Mars MAVEN, which stands for, well, I'll show you so you can see it yourself, the Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution Mission. This thing has been going around Mars since 2014, but the purpose of this mission was to discover where the air went. Because if Mars had water, it had more air. It lost its air somehow. And Maven realized that it is the sun that is causing air from Mars to be stripped away. The planet Mars is losing about 100 grams of air every single day, according to Maven's observations. 100 grams, kids, is a cheeseburger, right? Like a big cheeseburger. So a cheeseburger's worth of air doesn't sound like a lot of air to lose every day, but that's every day for millions and possibly billions of years. So Mars is losing its air to space the way that your sand castle loses its sand to the ocean. But the, what's causing the air to get blown away is not the light of the sun, but what we call the solar wind. So strange thing, why doesn't this happen to the Earth? If you have a compass, then you can detect the Earth's magnetic field. There is no magnetic field for the globe of Mars. So that magnetic field that we have around our planet that's generated by the dynamics of our magma moving inside of our metallic uh, core and crust, all these things, I'm not gonna go into the whole geology of it, but we have a magnetic field. And that magnetic field actually protects us from the solar wind. So the worst thing that happens to us is that instead of losing our atmosphere, we get things like the Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis. And uh, if you haven't seen it, there's a great place to go to see uh, the Northern Lights. There's the uh, spaceweather.com is a website that posts pictures from around the world. And here are pictures that people have taken in places like Greenland and in Finland and Nome, Alaska of the Northern Lights, the beautiful Aurora Borealis. That light that you see is generated by the sun's particles, protons and electrons striking our atmosphere, causing the atmosphere to glow. And that is a really cool effect because that means our air is actually not going anywhere. It's getting zapped, but it's not leaving because the magnetic field at, deflects the majority of the solar wind. Boy, that was quite a mouthful to explain all that. But what I wanna say is Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. Without a magnetic field, it cannot protect itself from the solar wind. And the solar wind has blown away Mars's air over the last few billion years. Earth does not have this problem and that is pretty simply possibly the, the main reason why we are habitable and Mars is not. You need to keep your air if you wanna stay warm. So let's go through back to the questions before I get too crazy here. Um, I think we're caught up on our question queue for right now. Oh, it so seems. yes, well, it looks like the atmosphere of Mars used to be more stable. Well, those are questions that about how it worked out and when and where it was a certain way. Those are harder to work out. The best thing we can do is look at the rocks, just like how we look at layers and fossils and sedimentary rocks to see uh, when things happen. We might be able to see atmospheric changes recorded by chemical changes in the rocks. Wait, uh, there's one more thing I want to introduce. I mean, maybe I should ask. This is a way to get make sure all of you folks haven't wandered back out to see that beautiful sunset because I don't blame you if you want to go out there and we'll be done with Night Owl Club in about 15 minutes. So make sure you get your questions in, folks. And um, does anyone know? Maybe let's see who can answer. Does anyone know why Mars is red? Christian, you don't count. I know you're going to know this answer. So anybody want to chime in? Who's going to be brave enough to speak up? I mean, we call it the red planet. It's not exactly red, but it's covered by this room. Well, I almost gave it away. Does anybody want to try? Come on, there's some kids that are that know the answer. Even if you don't know, I don't care if it's right or wrong. I wanted you to guess. I mean, why is Mars so red? Are there things on Earth that are red like Mars? 
Okay, we've got a brave volunteer. Go ahead, the Rice's family. Go ahead and unmute yourself, please. And I want to hear what your guess is. Iron. Woo, wait, yeah, wait, what, iron what? What about iron? You're right. But what happens to iron on Earth? Does it iron oxidizes. ever- oxidizes. Yes. Well, you sound like you know your chemistry, but yes. Oxidation is what most folks call rust. And Mars is covered in rusty, iron-rich dust. Now, rust doesn't just happen with iron. It has to happen something else. Oxidation, that means oxygen is there. In fact, the dust on Mars is rich in oxygen. It's, it's, it's ferric oxide. It's rusted iron. So where did all that oxygen come from? Well, on Earth, we have this thing called photosynthesis. We have these wonderful things called plants and algae and, and photosynthesizing bacteria that take the sunlight and take the CO2 in the atmosphere and crack the C from the O2 and release the O2 back into the air. And we get to breathe that and the C gets turned into carbohydrates like food or wood or sugar, maple sugar that's made from the sun. And the C, the sugar, the carbs in your maple sugar came from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So that process makes oxygen so that we can breathe photosynthesis. But if it wasn't for plants, then eventually all the oxygen in the air would settle into rust. Oxygen doesn't like to stay in the air. It's a very reactive thing. So this is another tantalizing thing about Mars. It is, yes, somebody wrote it. The Pellerin boys got the right answer, iron oxide. So think about what this means. This means that there was at least some time when there was significant amounts of oxygen in the atmosphere of Mars and whatever generated the oxygen stopped generating oxygen. And then the oxygen in the air rusted onto the iron in the ground. And now the oxygen is solid instead of a gas. But there's not enough in that to know for sure where that oxygen came from. But one tantalizing possibility is that maybe there was a process similar to photosynthesis if there was life on Mars. Maybe Mars had an oxygen rich atmosphere made by its own life, just like Earth's. And if that's true, then that would make it that Mars is like a twin to the Earth, except that Mars seems to have died compared to the life systems of the Earth. So I see another question about will the robot ever come back to perseverance? Now, this robot is what NASA is calling a technological demonstration, the tech demo. So it's not really that important compared to the rover. So there's no effort for them to pick up the helicopter after it's done flying because they don't want to endanger the rover. That's more important. And if we had to imagine trying to land that thing on top of the rover, if it broke something on the rover, that would be a tragedy. So no, ingenuity is mm, on its own from now, for now until forever, until maybe one of the kids on this gets on a space suit and goes out there and brings it to the the Fairbanks Museum on Mars, or, you know, we'll have an annex up there, you know, a satellite museum, and you can bring it in there. It will hopefully be the lucky museum to have that little robot on display someday in the future, but we can all dream. So any questions from anyone else coming up? We only have about 12 minutes left, folks. And actually, I, I had things I would like to point out that are going to be happening in the sky or things that you could see in the morning hours and we could talk about constellations. So remember, anything that's up in the sky, anything you've heard about is uh, up for grabs. Actually, I want to mention something that happened locally. Another media report came in recently. And I actually know the person who made the report. Let's see if I can pull it up for you folks. Oh, now. Uh, a friend of mine on Saturday was sitting at home and his wife was sitting near the window and she saw a fireball streak by out of the corner of her eye, but it was bright enough to be able to be seen from inside the house. That's not often that it happens. And I told my friend to go on the website for the American Meteor Society and make a report. And he did. And luckily, many other people saw the same thing. So let's see if I can uh, pull up that report for you folks. Hold on. Taking longer than I expected. But what I wanted to know is that if anyone out there watching, uh, tuning in here with the Fairbanks Night Owl Club, 
Did any of you see it too? Did any of you see something this weekend over the Northeast Kingdom? Let me know. I'm going to see if I can pull up this observation. Uh, there's so many. Let me show Let me navigate this with you folks together so you can see how many fireballs are happening every day and around the world where the reports are coming from. Oh, we got to go back a couple pages. Let's see. Oh, here it is. I think I found it. 21 people saw this one, event 2096. And if you look at the map, you can see where the people were witnesses. And there's my friend Joe bouncing up and down on the map. That's where he observed it. But folks observed it from as far north as Quebec City and as far south as Massachusetts. And one of the folks, luckily for all of us, had a camera that caught it. So Sylvie B, thank you very much. Somebody who lives up in Quebec. Sylvie, I assume she had a all sky camera. And this is one of the things that I would like to get one day. You can get this. It's like a security camera, but not for you know your property, but for the sky. It's an all night running uh, night vision camera. And it can record whenever a fireball is seen. So you don't even have to be up to see it. But if you have one of these, you won't miss them. And what a cool thing for me is, is that my friend made a report and thanks to him making a report on, and all these other folks making their reports, we were able to get a picture of the fireball that he saw from somebody who lives in another country. I mean, this is the wonders of public science, citizen science. And this website, again, amsmeteors.org is the place where you should go if you ever see a big meteor fireball in the sky. Of course, call, call us at the Fairbanks Museum too and let us know. Um, but we've been having a lot of that activity lately. Now, I see a question coming in from Julian, and I would love to answer this. Why did they send a rover to Mars and not another planet? Well, there aren't that many planets where we can actually land on. So let's just go through the list real quick. Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus, they're gas. So we'd have to have something that could float, but a rover wouldn't work there. Pluto? That would work because it has a hard surface, but Pluto is five light hours away from the sun or by rocket ship, about 10 years away. So we would be waiting a long time uh, for that robot to get there if we sent it as far as Pluto. And it's also 400 below zero. So a little bit of an engineering challenge to make a robot that can work under those conditions. However, then we've got the rocky planets closer to the sun. Mercury? Well, we have sent a robot to Mercury, but it was the messenger mission. And I actually had the privilege of meeting some of the scientists that worked on that mission. But that mission orbited Mercury, and it had to be designed to deal with the heat because on the sunny side of Mercury, it's 700 degrees Fahrenheit. And on the cool side of Mercury, it's 200 below zero. And if you're orbiting that planet Mercury, you have to deal with those temperature changes roughly every 90 minutes. So you can imagine how difficult it is to engineer something that can handle such a hot temperature and then such a cold temperature back and forth, back and forth. So landing on the surface, would you put a robot on a surface at 700 degrees Fahrenheit? I don't think so. It's going to melt. It's going to break. It's too hot. You can actually melt some metals at that temperature. So forget Mercury. What about Venus? Well, Julian, Venus is Earth's twin sister. It's the same size as Earth. It actually has more air than the Earth. Wait, hey, Christian, what about flying something on Venus? Would that work? You would have tiny little propellers. Venus has 90 times more air, so would you need 1 90th the size of a rotor uh, and maybe really slow speeds for your propellers and you could still fly Venus? But there's a problem with Venus. It's 900 degrees Fahrenheit. It's even hotter than Mercury. And that's because of its atmosphere. And it rains sulfuric acid on Venus. So good luck inventing that. My friend Julian, if you can invent a robot that can withstand 900 degree temperatures and sulfuric battery acid rain, then I think you have a career at the Boston Dynamics. They're definitely gonna wanna hire you, uh, but that is so difficult. So then what do we have left? We run out of places. We've got Earth and Mars. So that's why we haven't sent rovers to other planets. It is just simply too difficult. And uh, since we mentioned that, I just want to show you that just because we can't send robots easily to Venus doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Here is a little bit about Venus that you should know. 
Here's a picture of Venus. On the left is a daylight sunlight image from the outside where you can see the yellowish sulfuric acid clouds swirling around in a thick atmosphere. But on the right is an infrared picture showing you the heat coming from Venus's clouds. The clouds of Venus are hot enough to glow, not as bright as this, but you could see red glowing from the clouds at night. Obviously you wouldn't wanna live under those clouds. But we, NASA, the United States used a robot called Pioneer to orbit around Venus and map the surface with radar. Radar, radio waves can go right through clouds. So it wasn't difficult to make a radar map of Venus, but only one country has ever landed anything on Venus. And that is the same country that launched Yuri Gagarin, the former Soviet Union. And here is one of their many Venera robots. The Soviets landed robots on Venus. And basically what they did was make a gigantic refrigerator that could land on Venus and take a few pictures and transmit it. And I believe that Venera 13 was the one that lasted the longest. It lasted 90 minutes before it was reduced to a puddle of liquid metal on the surface of Venus. So that rocky surface that you see there, hard baked, acid rained, it must be one of the worst places to ever try to visit, but we do know what it looks like thanks to the Soviet Union's amazing space program. Not everything else works so well there, but their space program did some major accomplishments. So now, what about Ceres and Eros? Ooh. So Julian, you've asked some very good questions. But if everyone doesn't know what I'm talking about, Ceres and Eros are asteroids, or in the case of Ceres, a dwarf planet in the asteroid belt. And we actually have been, not to Eros up close as, as I'd like to go, but we've been to Ceres and Vesta, the number one and number two biggest asteroids in the asteroid belt. So we've actually uh, been to places like this. Let's see if I can pull up some cool pictures to show you. So. Oh, by the way, there's a Vermont connection to this. Ceres is the goddess of agriculture from the ancient Romans. And that's why we call grains cereals after Ceres. But Ceres was a dwarf planet discovered by a priest, Giuseppe Piazzi, in the, I think it was exactly 1800 that was the year that he found this little 300 mile wide dwarf planet going around the sun. So when you go to the state house in Montpelier and you look up at the goddess of agriculture, Ceres, standing on the state house, she's got an asteroid named after her that looks like this. Oh, 1801, sorry, not 1800. But on January 1st, 1801, Giuseppe Piazzi was looking through a telescope and he saw this, not in this view, but this is Ceres up close thanks to the Dawn spacecraft that visited this place. And in this picture, you will notice that Ceres is round it reminds me of the planet from The Little Prince, if you know that story. But it's only 300 miles wide. And do you see that white stuff in the middle of that crater? That caused quite the kerfuffle when that was discovered. That stuff there, some people thought it was ice. Some people thought it was salt. And some people thought it was aliens who had built a city on the surface of Ceres. But this is actually a mineral deposit on this. We know this place well because we've actually made a complete map of it with a spacecraft called Dawn, which was actually the first spacecraft built by NASA that visited two places. It visited uh, Ceres and then it visited Vesta. And that's amazing that it could visit two places. And that's because it had an ion engine, a very efficient kind of engine that could travel without using a lot of fuel. So real quick, we only have, oh, it's almost the end of the day and I wanna make sure I haven't missed any questions. So folks, please get your last questions in because it's almost eight o'clock. Night Owl Club is almost over, I'm sad to say, but here is the Dawn mission that took those pictures of Ceres that you saw. And then it did this, it went to Vesta, a second, the second biggest asteroid and it made a complete three-dimensional map. Notice how big the craters look in proportion to the size of the asteroid. And it's got stretch marks around the equator, implying some massive shape changes have happened there. But pretty cool. Oh, I guess I got the numbers wrong. I, I, I was to correct myself. It's Vesta that's 326 miles. Ceres is actually a little bit bigger. It's about 590 miles. But notice that these two are the roundest looking asteroids you'll ever see. The fact that they're round implies that they have a liquid core 
and gravity is able to shape them in that spherical way. So that's why big things are round in space. Gravity makes them round. But if you're very small, you might be able to keep yourself shaped like a potato instead. So speaking of potatoes, do we have any more questions? Christian, coming in from anywhere. Uh, I'm not seeing any in our queue or in the, the Zoom chat. Um, I did want to say you were talking about the uh, um, the density of the air on Venus and how that compares to like Mars and it's a lot easier to land on Mars than Venus because things melt on Venus. Um, but there is another place in the solar system where the thick atmosphere isn't accompanied by a lead melting temperature atmosphere. <laughs> and actually, um, so it's the Saturn moon Titan. Yes. And one of the one of the missions that we're planning to send there, it's called the Dragonfly. I think it's actually based on the Curiosity and Perseverance rovers, but instead of a rover, it's kind of like Ingenuity. It's a helicopter. It's like a drone, except it has four. It's a quadcopter. Um, and I think in the next decade or in the twenty late 2020s, I think we're planning to send that there, but uh, the rotors won't have to spin as fast there because I think Titan, just like Venus, I think it has a thicker atmosphere than Earth, but Titan is smaller like Mars, so it has the lower gravity plus the thicker atmosphere, so it's like the best of both worlds for a uh, rotor craft. And yeah, that's what we're planning on sending. So yeah, I was hoping you would bring that up or somebody would, because Titan, the place where it rains farts, methane rains out of the sky, 300 below zero. So we don't have to worry about the heat. Now we got the cold to deal with. But yes, Christian, it has 50% more air than we do. So the propellers have to be a lot smaller and compare this to Ingenuity. Ingenuity, the size of like a cheeseburger, this thing would be the size of a car. And so it would be like perseverance size, but flying around a place with thicker air. We've been there, but with a probe that could only fall through the sky just as quick as I can. I'll show you this. This is this is the Huggins probe descending through Titan. And those rivers and lakes you see are filled with liquid methane and liquid ethane. Farts and booze. Yeah, it's like Big Rock Candy Mountain all in space. So sorry, folks, but maybe that'll get the kids' attention. Yes, you can go to a place where it rains farts out of the sky. And it's not a planet, but a moon. So to make Julian's day, yeah, we have a lot of places where we can send rovers, but they're farther away or harder to get to, but that's all being planned. We also have the Europa Clipper mission coming up with Bruy that's gonna go under the ice. So we're gonna have rovers underwater, rovers under clouds, rovers on moons of Saturn and possibly Jupiter. It's all coming in the future. And the kids that are alive today are gonna be the ones making these missions. So get working, Julian, I wanna see your designs for something that can fly through Titan or swim on Europa, okay? And anyone else, please uh, let us know what you think of Night Owl Club, or please consider becoming a member of the Fairbanks Museum if you haven't already done so. And remember Yuri's Night uh, coming up this weekend on Saturday for the party, but the actual date is Monday. And if any of you know kids who are in our astronomy camp coming up this week, it's gonna be an exciting week here at the Fairbanks Museum. And there is one more thing, if you know any kids who would love to learn more about astronomy. We have astronomy camp in a box kits for sale. They're $30 and you have five days of fun activities that I helped put together with the team here at the Fairbanks Museum, but they're $25 if you're a member. So right there, if you become a member of the Fairbanks Museum, you can knock $5 off of your first purchase and get all the benefits of membership all around the world and all around the countries you travel to other museums. But I'm gonna leave it at that. Christian, is there anything you'd like to say before we sign off? Yeah, I just wanted to add at the very end. So um, uh, tonight there's actually a Soyuz launch happening uh, for an ISS crew rotation. And you had mentioned earlier the Dragon that's docked to the ISS is going to be relocating. And that's to make room for the next uh, crew Dragon that's going up in a couple weeks, I think. So very busy time with the ISS, but it's going to be it's going to be midday in Russia, but uh, or Kazakhstan. Um, but yeah, tomorrow people can check out the the video. Hopefully that launch going up and um yeah also we're doing our astronomy camp next week and the camp in a box so people should check all that out but yeah uh there was a lot of stuff we covered in this night owl club well I imagine trying to fit that in into the you know the couple minutes that i get on channel three wcax so this is why we launched night owl club so we can elaborate and give you more of what folks want to know so 
I don't see any more questions popping in. Thank you all for tuning in. If you head out right now, you'll be able to see Sirius, the brightest star, the nose of the dog, and Orion. And then if you look above Orion, you'll see the planet Mars hanging out in the head of Taurus the bull. So you, you can go see Mars right now as soon as we sign off, if you get out there in time. So thank you so for joining us on uh, the first nice weather version of Night Owl Club. And we'll be back again for the first Thursday, um, not the first Thursday, we gotta look at the date, but it will be after my next appearance in May on channel three. So, oh, I see some faces appearing there. All right, thank you all for joining us. It's so nice to see you all. Thank you, have a good night and keep looking up. Thank you everyone, see you all next month. <laughs>